So good afternoon and welcome to our virtual program, How to Help Your Child Cope with Stress and Anxiety. We are very grateful to have Drs. Lauren Kachukawis and Hoshatsu Barrett. So a little bit about our presenters. Dr. Gacha Weiss is the Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Fellowship Training Director at Jersey Shore University Medical Center and a practicing child and adolescent psychiatrist. She completed triple board residency training in New Orleans at Tulane University Medical Center and is board certified in pediatrics, psychiatry, and children and adolescent psychiatry. She has a specific interest in women's psychiatry, focusing on the peripartum period and treatment for both mothers and their young children. She's also interested in general child and adolescent psychiatry and psych psychiatry education. She supervises, teaches, and mentors medical students, psychiatry residents, and child, child and adolescent psychiatry fellows. Dr. Bauer is a compassionate and highly skilled psychiatrist, double board certified in both adult and child and adolescent psychiatry. He completed his psychiatry residence at Unity Health White County Medical Center in Searcy, Arkansas, followed by a fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry at the renowned Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Barrett has had the privilege of practicing in diverse settings, both patient and outpatient, serving rural and urban communities alike. He currently works with children, adolescents, and their families at Hackensack, providing thoughtful and personalized care to help them navigate mental health challenges. In addition to his clinical work, Dr. Barrett serves as the psychiatry clerkship director for St. George's University medical students, guiding future physicians in their psych psychiatric education. His areas of focus include working with adolescents facing ADHD, mood disorders, and anxiety. With his expertise in child and adolescent development, he is especially passionate about supporting young individuals as they transition into adulthood. So at this time, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Kacho Weiss. Hi, um, can you fix my video again, please? Uh, I had to put it on Do Not Disturb so the video access got lost. All right, um, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so today we're going to go through the following learning objectives, identifying your child's stress indicators um, from looking at this from a developmental perspective, learning how to address anxiety in a healthy, developmentally appropriate way, and understanding when to seek care um, for your child for their anxiety. The next slide. So what is anxiety? Um, it is a feeling that presents both mentally and physically. It can feel like your heart's racing, you're sweating, you may feel cold or hot, sick to your stomach, but it, there is also a mental component to it as well, where people feel may feel um, like they're having racing thoughts. Um, it is a reaction to a real perceived or imagined future threat. Um, and can be normal, right? We all kind of have times where we feel anxious. We may have something big at work coming up. We may be about to give a webinar to the community, um, you know, or taking a test, things like that. Um, but it can become problematic when it is excessive, um, it starts to get in your way or is difficult to control. So I will turn it over to my colleague for this next section. All right. Thank you very much. Again, my name is Dr. Broad. I'm one of the child and adolescent psychiatrists here at Hackensack. So in talking about anxiety disorders, it is probably the most, it is the most common psychiatric condition amongst children and adolescents. Some few numbers here, close to 10% of now children between ages 3 to 17 are experiencing some level of anxiety, and anxiety can have different forms, which we'll hopefully touch on a little bit later. Um, in 2016, about one in three individuals had anxiety with behavioral issues. One in three also had anxiety with depression. So anxiety as a whole has 
significant comorbidities, depression, uh, behavioral issues, ADHD. Again, these are stuff that we will kind of touch on a little bit later. And I think it's no kind of surprise that the rates of anxiety has been increasing, especially children and adolescents, especially with the fallout since the pandemic. You know, we've seen a lot of increased cases involving that. And rates of being diagnosed with anxiety has increased from 5% 2007 up to 6.4% um, for most recent data from 2011-2012. I have, wasn't able to find more recent data, but I would assume based on just clinical practice that that rate has also been increasing. All right. And you could kind of see in this graph here, this is from CDC's website. They monitor kind of mental health trends. So we have de depression, anxiety, behavior order uh, disorders by age. And you could see anxiety is pretty much prominent in, in you know, six to 11 years, but really that 12 to 17 age is kind of the sweet spot where we see a lot of anxiety disorders. So my colleague kind of touched on a little bit about what anxiety looks like and anxiety changes as we grow. So it's important to kind of see where it starts as preschoolers going into school age and adolescent. Typically we, you know, with kids, stranger danger, separation anxiety are the ones we kind of see very early on in development around seven, eight months of age. Ideally resolution uh, around two years of age. Anxiety also is situational in terms of nighttime routine, being in the dark, you know, having the the teddy bear or the nightlight to help them kind of cope with that uh, anxiety. As we kind of age, school age children become scared of situational anxiety, so storms, you know, whether or not getting hurt. And then as we progress into like teenage years, high school, our anxiety is more related on environmental stuff regarding school or social events. So I'm going to kind of touch on these a little bit more individually. So as parents, as caregivers, some of the risk factors and warning signs that we kind of see with individuals with anxiety um, may start experiencing this intense fear. Again, the fear can be related in something realistic or at times unable to identify. There's also a shame related to the. They feel like they're the only ones kind of dealing with this. The anxiety becomes so distraught that they begin exhibiting anger. They feel low, low self-esteem and even sadness because they're unable to control this anxiety or even communicate how this anxiety uh began in the first place. We often see, especially in younger populations, behavioral inhibitions so unable to kind of regulate themselves when they're feeling anxious or overwhelmed. Anxiety is also related to some sort of traumatic event, whether it be a loss of a loved one. Uh, I mentioned earlier the pandemic kind of being away from their school friends, not able to kind of interact in their normal day-to-day -day life. Early life stressors, loss, parenting styles can also be a risk factor um, for anxiety. And there's also a genetic component as well. So as we kind of go through anxiety through specific age groups, starting with preschool, which kind of is defined between ages three to five, most of it, it usually involves like a sense of clinginess, separation anxiety. You may have experiences with your own children, you know, reluctance to go to school, feeling that, you know, something bad's going to happen to their parents, mom or dad. Anxiety is more very externalizing at this age as well. So we do see an increase in temper tantrums, meltdowns. It is not uncommon for them to have physical complaints as a manifestation of their anxiety. So you may have a child that may experience increased headaches, tummy aches, 
We talked about sleep disturbances. And one of the things that we see usually at this age is a regression of already established behavior. So using thumb uh, sucking, using a security object. At times we see, you know, um, bedwetting revert again. A lot of times these behaviors are a form of self-soothing for the patient to kind of deal with their anxiety. So this is some stuff to kind of look out for. As we progress around school age children, this will identified between ages six and 12. Anxiety, though um, there is some component of like externalizing behavior, we're starting to get more into inter internalizing. So they tend to worry a lot. They're requiring constant assurance. They always wanna know where we're going, who's gonna be there. So, and it for them, it's safety, making sure everything's okay. We begin to see kind of irritability, moodiness as well. There is a component of like social withdrawal. They're less engaged with their peers, maybe family members, even siblings. With anxiety, if we're worried about everything else, we're not maintaining our focus in areas that require our attention. So we definitely start to see difficulty concentrating. Usually this shows up in academic performance. Fear of failure begins to show because they're beginning to demonstrate what's called mastery. They want to kind of be good at certain things. So they're always kind of worried about like, am I not good enough? Am I going to fail? Versus, you know, emphasizing the effort they put in and the progress they have made. Adolescence. So this is identified ages 13 through 17. These individuals, a lot of their anxiety is kind of brought up in their environment now in school and linked to academic performance. You know, am I good enough? Am I going to do well on my SATs next week, which I just had a patient this morning that was very anxious about that. Um, the concern here, too, at this age, there is a lot of kind of high risk behaviors in an effort to minimize their anxiety. Usually that does involve substance uses. So being aware, you know, having early conversations about alcohol, nicotine, marijuana, sometimes social isolation, avoidance is how anxiety presents at this age because the stressors of school, it's better not to just deal with it. So we, I do, um, have issues with like truancy, people not attending school. And as a result, that leads to decline in overall academic performance. A lot of this age group focus on perfectionism versus progress. So if they don't get that A on their tests or they don't get, you know, enrolled in the specialized charter school, then it was all for nothing. So helping them understand that not everything is black and white and there are areas in between that it could excel in. And I kind of went through the spectrum of anxiety through the ages, but understand that within anxiety, we have several different areas. So we have what's called like separation anxiety. Those are typically individuals younger, so our preschool uh, age children. We have individuals with selective mutism, Though I don't see it as often, it does occur where individuals will just not participate in certain settings in verbal communication. Elsewhere, they are just chatty Cathy's. Specific phobias um, are a common one with school-age children. So I have certain children that are afraid of certain animals. They don't want to go near them, despite you know no significant kind of stress or rebellion around them. Social phobia, social anxiety disorder are very common, especially with our adolescent population. Anxiety, you know, we all have forms of anxiety, but over time, anxiety can ev um, evolve into what's called like a panic disorder. So when you feel like you have little to no control, you feel like the walls are closing in on you. So this could be kind of exaggerated presentation of anxiety. Agoraphobia, so these are those fears of public places. Um, most commonly, I see this with school-age children as well. 
in settings like grocery stores, Target, um, and sometimes schools as well. And then we have kind of our generalized anxiety disorder, which is common through all lifespan of ages, not just, you know, just children, adults, general population. So this is kind of, you know, we have anxiety, but what, what are we doing with that anxiety? Anxiety is a normative emotion to help us protect us in fearful, stressful situations. But sometimes the anxiety gets into the way of everything. I like to kind of frame anxiety overall like uh, a fire alarm. And a fire alarm in the part of the brain, it's supposed to help to protect us from any perceived dangers. But sometimes that fire alarm keeps going on and on and on. So we need ways to kind of distinguish that fire alarm so it's not going off in every situation. I think Dr. Weiss, is this where you're picking up? <laughs> Sure, I'm happy to. Um, so just a quick note um, that, you know, these symptoms and disorders tend to overlap. Um, like we mentioned, anxiety is this normative emotion and feeling that we all have. Um, but there are times where you may see some symptoms of separation mixed with some symptoms of generalized anxiety. So those are just things to keep in mind. And as we uh, mentioned before, um, it is very, very common for a child with an anxiety disorder to also have what we call a comorbid disorder. So a disorder that's occurring at the same time as an anxiety disorder like depression, ADHD, or possibly other behavioral disorders. Next slide, please. Oh, sure. So we're going to um, move from what it looks like, how it presents, into how we can help. Um, so these are the topics that I'm going to touch on over the next couple of slides. So how we can get parents and caregivers involved in working with children, how you can work with your child's school and within the school system, when to seek out professional help, and kind of what that professional help will look like. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're gonna take some time on this slide, um, but it's really important that as the caregiver yourself, you learn and teach relaxation and mindfulness skills. Um, so this is something that you can do by looking up some of the resources um, that you can see on our slide, um, but also by utilizing your pediatrician or a mental health professional to be like, hey, I really need help learning these things. You know, Can I set up a couple sessions with you um, to kind of go through how I could teach how I can learn these to then teach my child. Um, so one of the most important things we teach is deep breathing. Um, and I love to teach it um, as breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth. I often talk about uh, smelling flowers and that's how I you know, will uh, explain it to a child. So mouth closed, really taking that deep breath in, really trying to get that smell of flowers and then blowing it out through your mouth. Um, and you could say it's just like blowing bubbles or it's like blowing out birthday candles. Those type of analogies, I feel like really help children understand that instead of just saying breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth, but doing that a few times can really activate your um, calming nerve, calming part of your nervous system. Believe it or not, there are there is a calming part of your nervous system that helps settle everything down. There is also another breathing technique called the four, seven, eight breathing technique. This one's a little bit different with, again, with a goal to regulate breathing. Um, so breathing in and holding it for four seconds, or breathing in, excuse me, for four seconds, and then holding that breath for seven seconds. And this is really supposed to help activate a nerve in your body that is the relaxation nerve um, to kind of help settle out your system. And then you exhale, for eight seconds, um, it may take some practice. It, you know, I know the numbers may not seem long, but when you do this actually in practice, it can feel like quite a bit of time. So those are just some quick breathing skills um, that you can do at home. Progressive muscle relaxation. Um, you know, we use this, um, and the way I explain this to kids is that your bodies react to stress and anxiety. Right? We talked about some of what this could look like in terms of physical symptoms, headaches, upset stomachs, tight muscles, um, maybe heart racing, maybe, you know, thoughts coming at people very quickly. Um, 
So this is this is a technique you can use. I use the spaghetti noodle analogy um, so that when we're anxiety, our bodies feel tight and straight like an uncooked spaghetti noodle. Um, and then as you start to kind of relax, the spaghetti noodle um, becomes cooked, it gets relaxed, right? So it's nice and loose um, and you can wave it around and it moves. And so that's what we're really looking at to kind of explain how our bodies can be tense and tight, like that uncooked spaghetti uh, when we're anxious. And then when we're feeling more relaxed, we're kind of like that cooked spaghetti noodle where we're just kind of loose. And that's a fun one for kids to do you know, um, to practice feeling their muscles being tense, you know, you can have them stand straight up, um, you know, nice and tight in a line. Um, and they can feel sort of how tense that feels and then practice kind of being the loosey goosey cooked spaghetti noodle. There are other different ways of doing progressive muscle relaxation that are out there and um, definitely something to talk with your providers about. Um, the safe, happy place technique is where we invite people, um, especially kids, to use their imagination. So we ask them to vis visualize a place that makes them happy. It doesn't have to be a real place. It, it can be a real place, um, or it could be an imagined place from a book or a favorite movie. And then kind of use their senses to really kind of lose themselves in the place for a little bit, um, sort of taking their mind off of the thing that's stressing them by really focusing all of their senses on this safe, happy place. I always give the example, for me, it's Starbucks. Um, you know, so I love to walk into Starbucks. I like to sit in the comfy leather chairs there. And then I like to smell the coffee. I like to hear the sound of music and people talking and laughing. Um, and then obviously the taste of the coffee helps too, right? So I'm utilizing all of those different senses. Um, and then have them kind of, when they come out of that, refocus on how their body feels um, and with the goal of, you know, having them notice that they're feeling overall less tense or that their heart rate's overall lower, or maybe that their breathing has regulated or their belly feels better, those type of things. Um, and then give really specific labeled phrases um, for courageous actions and behaviors. And what I mean by that is not just good job, um, although we all love a good, great job. Um, but really specific to the behavior that you want to see um, increase or continue. So you did a really good job of getting out of the car calmly this morning and walking into school. Um, so very specific, like I said, to the behavior that you want to see. You did a really good job, you know, sitting quietly during that test. Um, and then coming up with a reward system. Um, we do this a lot at night, um, especially for kids who don't sleep in their own beds. Um, you know, so if you sleep in your bed for three nights, this is the reward you get. If you sleep in your bed for six nights, this is the reward you get. And so really focusing on what we call sort of positive reinforcement by putting something, by giving something to somebody to increase the behavior that you wanna see happen. Um, oh, I realized I skipped over the 333 rule. This is another mindfulness technique that you can use. Um, you can almost play it like a game like I spy. But again, it's really to sort of distract um, and kind of recenter and be mindful in the moment. So you can, you know, focus on three smells in the room. You can um, have your child do I spy with three different red objects in the room. But it's kind of a way to sort of distract and bring them back to the present moment by having them do those tasks. Um, next slide, please. Other things um, that you can do in addition to practicing mindfulness and relaxation skills are spending one-on-one -on -one time with your child without screens. I know we're all busy as parents and caregivers. We all have a million responsibilities and wear a bunch of different hats, um, but some things that you could do and I would even argue, I know this is 10 minutes, I would even argue for five minutes. If you're doing an activity with, you know, your child for five minutes a day where it's just one-on-one -on -one time and you're kind of letting the child lead, um, that's going to go a really, really long way. Um, but it could be playing a game. It could be drawing. It could be just watering plants, you know, um, but something that where you guys are interacting together for that period of time. The goal of that is to foster, you know, the relationship and open communication. Developing positive routines, including bedtime routines, um, can be really helpful, right? So keeping things on a regular schedule, whether it's playtime, mealtime, bedtime, 
a combination or all of those things um, with the goal of helping set expectations. Um, and so, you know, when kids kind of know what's coming, sometimes it makes things a little bit less scary for them. Um, a note on sleep for this, sleep is really, really important. School-age children need about nine to 12 hours of sleep a night. Teenagers need about eight to 10 hours of sleep a night. Um, I know it's often shifted uh, sometimes for our teenagers and school systems don't help with the early school times, uh, but it is important to try to encourage you know, them to get the appropriate amount of sleep. Um, Having a plan around media, especially as you know, my colleague mentioned with the COVID-19 pandemic and sort of the fallout post-pandemic with lots of natural disasters lately and you know, a very charged political climate, um, setting screen time and monitoring screen time can be helpful. Um, you know, so maybe having a child, if they have their own devices, consume media you know, on their personal devices, but in a shared space, um, filtering out, you know, kind of how much news is on in the background at home or filtering out um, maybe movies and things that you think the kids aren't watching, but are listening to. Um, and so just kind of being mindful of um, what's kind of playing in the background in terms of, of media. Um, modeling and encouraging healthy habits. What we mean by that is being active, trying for about an hour a day. It doesn't all have to be at once. You can, um, you know, split it up, you know, 10 minutes here, 15 minutes there, go play outside, get some uh, great sunshine, although not today, at least where I am at the shore. Um, or you could dance inside, you know, to, to favorite songs or dare I say, even there are certain video games where you have to get up and move. Um, you know, while you're playing, but at least there's some type of physical activity there. And then obviously eating healthy too is important. Um, in terms of school, helping the kiddos really set realistic goals. This is tough because there's so much pressure nowadays. Um, like my colleague mentioned, there's sort of this culture of achievement and really this pressure to do well. Um, and, you know, I know personally for my own son, one of whom is nine, um, anytime I ready is talked about, we immediately get anxious. We, you know, even though he does fine, um, but just to the thought of I ready coming up and having to sit there and do I ready, his brain starts going to all the, well, what if I'm the last one? What if that means I'm not doing well? Um, what if I'm getting the questions wrong? And, you know, it's, there's a lot of standardized assessments now that, children are having to do, um, which can contribute to the anxiety. Um, so helping them set kind of realistic goals, you know, for their performance. Um, and again, positively praising what is going well. A big one I use in my house is, um, I'm so happy that you tried your best on this test. Um, nothing about the grade, um, nothing about, you know, the content of the test, but just that you tried your best and you gave it your all. That's, you know, what I'm looking for. So, pray, you know, positively praising was, I'm so proud that you completed iReady, even though you said it was really hard to do. Um, all right. And you guys, you know, um, reminding them that before they go into this stressful situation, I just had this conversation this morning because it's iReady time. Um, you know, but practicing those skills um, before getting into the school for the day. Um, next slide, please. So working at the school, I think we all know, you know, the importance of going to school, regular school attendance, you know, can help in a lot of different developmental areas. Um, so explaining that in a way to your child, you know, that's not coming across punitive and things like that. Um, but, it, you know, just that it is important to go and that this is a part of growing up and part of, you know, your normal development. Speaking to the child's teacher and having a way of communication with the child's teacher is huge. Whether, you know, asking their preferred form of communication, whether, you know, it's through you know, an app or email. Um, but I find that, you know, I, I often tell parents, look, like, give your teacher, give the child's teacher a heads up if you feel comfortable doing that. They're like, hey, you know, Johnny might be feeling a little bit anxious today, or he stated to me he was nervous about the test. Um, you know, just wanted to let you know in case there was any way, you know, to support him during the day. Um, having your child identify a trusted adult is actually one of the things they found that helps decrease school avoidance and helps um, kids feel 
um, like they have support in the school system. Um, so whether that is their teacher, whether that's a different type of teacher, maybe a spe special teacher or a paraprofessional or a guidance counselor, um, working with them to find somebody that they feel like they could go talk to if they're starting to feel anxious or overwhelmed. And then finding out what resources are available in your school. Um, is there a guidance counselor on site? Um, if not, um, you know, is there somebody who is available to meet with kids to discuss these issues? Um, and then all public schools um, have a child study team where they have a team of professionals who meet together to help the child succeed um, in school to the best of their ability. And if, and we'll talk about uh, when we, treatment on the next slide, um, but if you feel like the anxiety is getting in the way of academic performance, this is absolutely when we should start talking to the child study team and considering possible accommodations within the school system um, to allow your child to really you know, function to the best of their ability. Um, next slide, please. All right, so when to seek help. Um, like I said, you know, there there is that spectrum of normal to kind of what's too much and what's getting in the way. And that's really what we look at as child psychiatrists. How much are these symptoms getting in the way in different areas of the child's overall functioning? So is it getting in the way of school and academics? It, you know, is it causing difficulty with peer interactions? Is it causing difficulty with family interactions? Um, you know, that those are all the different systems that kids function in on a day-to-day -day basis. So if it's causing difficulty or decline in any one of those areas, um, we would say it would be time to talk to somebody, but also medical health. Um, a lot of times with anxiety, I see, you know, with sometimes with difficulty breathing um, or worsening headaches or stomach aches, um, that it could also make an underlying medical um, condition sometimes worse, specifically like asthma or migraines, things like that. New symptoms appear, so things that you haven't seen your child do before, um, that you're now seeing these things happen and that you're concerned about. If there has been a stressful or traumatic event that have that has occurred, it's worthwhile checking in with a professional. You yourself begin to feel overwhelmed, anxious. Like we are here to also support parents and caregivers. Like I said, you know, we're, we're more than happy to help teach some of those relaxation and mindfulness skills so that you could utilize those at home. Um, and if you're unsure, it's always great to check in with your primary care provider um, or a pediatrician or even, you know, seeking us out and we can tell you things are good, but we'll keep an eye on it or, you know, we think treatment's warranted. Next slide, please. So what does professional help look like? Um, so there's a couple of different things. There's individual therapy, there's medication management, and then there's the combination of both. So there is that supportive psychotherapy and education that's more along the lines of kind of what I said about, you know, going over mindfulness and relaxation skills. Really the gold standard for anxiety disorders is something called cognitive behavioral therapy for anxiety. And what this does is focuses on how the child thinks about their fears, can possibly increase um, their exposure to feared situations um, in a safe environment. Um, helps teach them relaxation skills, but then also helps with positive self-talk, reminding them that, you know, kind of the flipping the script of like, I can't do this to, I really tried my hardest, I gave it my best. Um, if there are more severe symptoms at play, or it's really impacting the child's functioning, we recommend a combination of medication and therapy together. Um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors um, are the medication of choice. They are an antidepressant medication. I'm not going to go too much into detail, um, you know, during this talk today, but they are safe and effective um, and the first line treatment for pediatric anxiety disorders. We know treatment works um, when you treat the anxiety disorders with a combination of medications. About 80% of children had a response with cognitive behavioral therapy and the medication. Um, and about 65% of those kids had no or minimal symptoms of anxiety after about three months of treatment. Um, so treatment definitely works. Um, definitely feel free to, to reach out to any one of us um, if you feel like that is something that you need for your child. Next slide. 
And the goals are really to have the child and the caregiver learn that this is manageable, right? Like we've mentioned, this is a spectrum. We all have anxiety at times. Um, we just need to get it back down to a manageable level where the um, child's functioning to their best, to the best of their ability. And sometimes we need help to do that, right? I always tell my kiddos, like you wouldn't walk on a broken leg. Um, you'd use a crutch or you use a wheelchair. Right now, we're going to help your brain and we may use, you know, therapy as sort of a crutch or a wheelchair until we kind of get your brain feeling a little bit better. Um, but the goal is to increase, like I said, quality of life, get them back to baseline. If their grades went from, you know, B's to D's, get them back up to those B's um, and then really decrease risk of developing other disorders, um, specifically depression and behavioral disorders. We know that untreated anxiety um, can feel really pretty terrible at times. And so we want to um, avoid the risk of this turning into depression or on the other side of things, you know, moving into more of a behavioral disorder or increasing risk for, for substances. Um, next slide, please. These are some of our resources. Um, most of them are ready, readily available. One of them is kind of the gold standard textbook for child and adolescent psychiatry, but the rest are pretty um, freely available on the web. I'll direct you to um, you know, our national organization. They have something called Facts for Families um, that can be really helpful for families just looking for more information about any type of mental health condition. Um, next slide, please. Okay, we will move into the question part of today's webinar. Thank you very much, doctors. That was very helpful and informative. So we will go to some questions. Um, the first question is, can anxiety in preschool age, three to five-year-old, can this be outgrown or improved? It absolutely can. Um, it, so we... I, I personally work with younger kids myself um, and I think they, the child just turned four, um, but they're having pretty significant separation anxiety at night. Um, and so we're working together with the family um, to come up with, you know, positive behavioral ways to navigate the separation difficulty at night. The school has been okay for the most part, but it's the nighttime stuff that we're, we're struggling with. So yes, even though it's, you know, present and um, possibly causing some difficulty, it can be outgrown and it can be treated. Great, the next question, what is the impact of hereditary heredity on anxiety and depression? That is a good question. Um, and had, to be honest with you, I'd have to look it up. Um, I don't know if my colleague knows off the top of his head the specific um, percentage. We do know that it plays a role, um, and that if you know a family member is anxious, that it, it is it can increase the chances of the the child being anxious, but doesn't necessarily mean the child will develop an anxiety disorder. So I'll jump in just a little bit. So kind of the numbers wise, I've seen data anywhere between like 20 to 30 percent her heritability factor mm -hmm. first uh, from a parent onto a sibling. I think the main thing when I talk about like genetic predisposition with families is the risk is there. But what are we doing to minimize that risk mm -hmm. for the continue of the lifetime? Like we talked about early on having the discussions how to self-regulate ourselves. Mm -hmm breathing exercises, grounding techniques, mm -hmm. setting that as the standard early as possible will decrease the exposure of developing a generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety. So we want to limit as best as we can, even though we know that we have like a parent or a sibling that has anxiety, start early on mm -hmm. and you are least likely to have. And even if you have those later in life, it is overall less severe. I think mm -hmm. that's the goal right there. It's like, all right, yes, you have anxiety, but compared to maybe someone else that didn't exercise or didn't have breathing techniques or mindfulness mm -hmm. or even a little bit of therapy early on, you know, you're in a much better place and it's more manageable. I think that's the key term 
for all of us to remember is like, I cannot promise you anxiety will ever go away, but my goal is to make it more manageable for mm-hmm. you and to have more good days than bad days. And when the bad days come, you have the skills and tools mm-hmm. to persevere. I don't know if that answered the question, but I feel like it did. Thank you. The next question is, as mentioned, some of these anxieties are normal, especially with younger children. Example, afraid of the dark, separation anxiety, reassurance. How do you know when it's a problem that needs medical intervention, including a mental health professional? So if it's getting to the point where, you know, they're not sleeping well, it's causing pretty much the way I frame it, like, how's the next day look? Are we irritable? Are we dragging? Are we not wanting to go to school? And that continues to persist. Like, okay, Mm -hmm. let's see if we need to talk to someone. Usually what happens is I get referrals from like pediatrician office. Like they, so they'll kind of do their assessment, make sure there's nothing medically kind of going uh, wrong. And then they'll kind of refer to me and then we'll see, okay, this looks like some anxieties. What are we doing? What's our nighttime routine look like? What I even go back to what our routine looks like as soon as we get home from school. Mm-hmm. That's where it kind of says like, are we, you know, are we straight into homework? Are we doing this? Are we doing that? So I try to paint a picture like what the routine looks like up to bedtime and how we could minimize any kind of disruptions at bedtime. We kind of talked about limiting the screens. I am no stranger. I have one on my wrist, two right here, this, that, my laptop, my PlayStation. I got them everywhere. So, I, and I tell my patients like, this is a challenge just as is for me. So I don't want you to feel like you're the only one, but working with the families, understanding what these routines look like. And like I said, if it's causing issues, the mm-hmm. next, that's usually kind of my spidey sense. I was like, okay, look, there's something going on here. I don't know, Dr. Weiss, if you would have anything to add to that. No, I agree. Um, it's it's looking at how it's impacting not only the child, but the family unit as well, right? Um, mm-hmm. And I think if it starts to impact those relationships in a negative way, or it starts to impact academic performance because we're tired and we're cranky, you know, from not sleeping well the night before or fighting about sleep, um, you know, then that's a good time to, to seek out some care. Okay, thank you. The next question is, um, my four-year-old daughter has been having issues with going to the bathroom, number two. She tends to um, have accidents in her pants at school. Could this be related to having anxiety or emotions dealing with school? It could be. It definitely could be. Um, One of the things that we look at from a behavioral standpoint for that is scheduling toilet times um again lots of really positive rewards um when she is using the toilet appropriately um but it's definitely worth getting a you know checking in with your pediatrician looking at diet possibly doing a medical workup making sure that there's nothing that we're missing um you know possibly from a constipation um situation or something along those lines we just want to make sure that the gut system is healthy um before we would kind of go down the anxiety pathway. Okay, the next question, is there a correlation of anxiety and night terrors? I don't know off the top of my head, to be honest with you. Um, I don't believe so, given that night terrors tend to kind of be more of a traditional sleep disorder. They are definitely scary for the caregiver um, who's experiencing them because they're hearing their child move and they're hearing their child scream. Um, And, and, you know, but for the most part, the child does not remember any of it the next day. Um, So while it is scary for the caregiver, um, the child, they're, usually not ones to remember. Now, nightmares are something that's a little bit different where it can be correlated specifically with like a separation anxiety disorder where there's, you know, themes of loss, you know, um, or they're worried about being, you know, having dreams about being separated from a caregiver. Um, 
So I think it just depends, you know, are we looking at like the true version of night terrors where it's the, they're not remembering the next morning or is it more the nightmare type of situation um, where then that I think would need to be looked at. Um, but again, it's always worth talking. You know, that's why we're here. We're here to support you guys. Um, so it's, it's always worth bringing this up to your pediatrician um, and seeing, picking their brains and seeing if they think we would be a good fit for, for you. Yeah. And they have two different workups too, like a night terror right. versus nightmare, like nightmares. The kids eventually will become like, I'm scared to go to sleep because I'm mm -hmm. having this and that anxiety builds up versus how you were mentioning the night terrors. They have no semblance of what happens. And the next morning, it's like they thought everything was okay. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. The next question is, um, any additional tips for coping with a child um, with a mid-anxiety attack? Hyperventilating, hysterical crying, can't catch breath usually from not being able to do something and um, perfectly did it perfectly the first time. I could jump in real quick here. So in the midst of like that episode, I think the first thing to do is just one, create like a safe space for mm -hmm. them. It's not running to put out the fire immediately. Mm -hmm. It's just making sure everything's safe with of uh, parents, I actually work with the, the whole families. Like, where's the space in your house that we can identify if you ever have like a panic attack or a heightened level of anxiety? Is it the garage? Is it your backyard? Is it your room or your playroom? Okay, cool. Do we have any stuff, animals there? Do we have any fidget toys? Something to kind of one lessen the burden of the, the anxiety attack, distract you. And I tell them like, all right, let them, you know, if they need to cry it out, mm -hmm. like, cry it out and then touch base with them like 30 minutes, 60 minutes, whatever it is. Are you ready to talk about it? Can we talk about it? You know, versus what happened? What, why, what, does something happen? You know, more times than not, they just want someone there to be present and mm -hmm. to just update what they're doing. I don't know if you would add anything else to that picture. No, I agree. It's so hard. It is so hard when those panic attacks happen. Um, it's usually, of course, like right in the middle of doing something or you need to go somewhere. Um, but I agree with my colleague, creating that safe space and just letting the child know that you're there is going to go a really, really long way, right? Like we have the child's going to have to feel their feelings and learn how to self-regulate. And in the mid middle of the panic attack is not going to be the best time to try to teach them these skills. It really is when they're settled down and they're feeling better when we can kind of review and be like, let's talk about what happened. Um, let's, you know, practice some, you know, tips and techniques for next time. Um, but it's so important, you know, that the child feels like that they can experience this with you there being supportive, as difficult as it is for you as the caregiver to have to kind of witness it. This goes back to just like modeling and those techniques that we yeah. mentioned earlier i tell parents like those golden times when you're dropping your kid off in school it's just you guys in the car or whatnot those are great times to like practice these techniques mm -hmm. and you pick a technique i'll pick a technique and we'll just kind of practice so i tell them don't wait to use them in times of crisis because right you will remember it at that time no, <laughs> no so you it's won't afford <laughs> to kind of practice this just like you do anything else like if you're in band you practice your trumpet if you're you know basketball you practice your jumps same thing you just practice those are great tips the next question is um my son has sensor sensory processing disorder and has adhd and experiences anxiety and emotional dysregulation and is overly sensitive for someone like him, can you go over again what therapy is optimal? Is seeing an OT who specializes in emotional dysregulation a good option? It could be. Um, I, I think, you know, these questions about specific individuals can be tough, and I definitely recommend um, following up with your pediatrician. Um, but in terms of helping navigate some of the symptoms described, um, it's 
you know, we always tell people that, yes, this is the gold standard, right? Like this is what's been studied. This is what we know in terms of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, but for the individual with other, you know, comorbid diagnoses, it's important to, you know, really do the evaluation and say, okay, like where, where do we need to go first? I actually, I don't think for, um, I don't think anything that this person said they're currently on, undergoing is a is a bad idea it sounds like everything's appropriate um and any further support that could be provided um you know it's worth talking to the the pediatrician about thank you um the next question is let's see um your son has difficulty attending school due to um his multiple disabilities any suggestions to uh, relieve school anxiety with children with ADHD and dyslexia? I think this question kind of goes mm -hmm. back to, you know, the child study evaluation. Mm -hmm. What resources are best available to the patient, the family, and what are we doing to school? The goal is to kind of maintain a semblance of normalcy, like mm -hmm. attending school, but there could be times where home instruction may be warranted. So what does that look like? Is that defined in the plan? And what are we doing to kind of minimize the burden of anxiety? It's not uncommon for uh, individuals that are struggling with like anxiety around school, a delayed start, like 15 minutes after everyone's entered. Mm -hmm. These are just common ones I've heard from my patients. Um, also maybe having time outside of the classroom if they're feeling overly anxious, having like a little five minute break. I think this really is a more kind of individualized question in terms of what the current resources are available at the school mm -hmm. and how the school can best help. Perfect, thank you. Um, so the next question is what if the anxiety attack happens outside the home, somewhere outdoors? Any specific tips with that? I would echo what we said before, um, making sure it's, there's a safe space. Um, if, you know, where, wherever you're at, you know, obviously if they're in the middle of the street, moving them over, you know, to the sidewalk or things like that. Um, or if you're in a park, um, you know, finding maybe a bench, um, a grocery store, um, maybe leaving the store, um, and heading out to the car. Um, but just trying to find that safe space, um, in the moment is, is helpful. Perfect. Let me see. I just want to take a look at what else was submitted. Um, there is a question about um, her daughter's um, 20 in, in college, has anxiety on a daily basis. Um, she's a highly functioning college student, um, but has a lot of anxiety regarding everyday life. Um, so any suggestions um, or tips for that? A lot of schools have um, counselors on site. Um, so uh, looking into her um, school's resources and seeing what's available there, I think that's a really good place to start. Um, but then also, um, you know, checking in with her primary, um, especially on the adult side, um, it might be a little bit easier um, to get access to a psychiatrist that way. Yeah. One of the, I work with a lot of like high school seniors. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we always talk about is transition planning, mm -hmm. especially if they're going to colleges outside of the state or whatnot. So the, some of the homework I even provide, I was like, mm -hmm. I want you to look up what student wellness looks like mm -hmm. at your school. Exactly. All right, cool. Let's see it. Make, can you make an appointment ahead of time? If so, we do that. So again, it's just a lot of planning and I'll echo my call. I'll, pretty much every university, every college has some form of counseling or access to mental health services. Uh, counseling for sure. Like I, I don't think I've seen any, any institution that does not provide some level of counseling. And if they need a little bit more intensive counseling, they have available resources within the community. Uh, my my wife works at Rutgers University in their wellness and uh, student health center. So she 
she tells me like all the resources and everything that are available. So. All right, thank you so much, doctor. So we are just about out of time. So we will um, wrap it up at this point. Um, thank you so much. Um, it was very helpful and informative. You gave um, great tips that I'm definitely um, gonna use now on the car rides to school. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, please watch your email for an evaluation of the program and please take time to fill it out. We want to hear from you. Uh, you know, if you're interested in other topics, you can let us know. The link of the recording will also be included in that email as well. And you can feel free to join us for our next Parent Guardian webinar, which is on decoding allergies. And that's taking place on October 17th. You could always visit our website or call 1-800-560-9990 to register and find out about more information about other uh, upcoming programs. So thank you again. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and take care. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye.